Okay, looks like we are live. So, people asked me for an overview of modern Jewish history. And um, I put this together pretty quickly. Um, it is my view. It's not necessarily something that a lot of people are going to agree with and i didn't really take the time to be fair to everyone so um there's there are definitely things that people are going to disagree with especially people who are not religious especially people who are not Orthodox uh, Jewish. And while I am not much of an Orthodox Jew myself, uh, I think the, the writings on the wall for reform and conservative, uh, which is part of the reason <laughs> people might get mad at this especially coming from a reform or conservative view of things but i th i can certainly um i can defend my position i believe okay sorry but uh I was getting an error message. I am hoping that's, I have no idea why, but okay. So let's start. Well, um, I'm not going to start at the beginning, certainly. When we talk about modern Jewish life, I think the best place to start is from the invention of the printing press because i think that's the last place where jewish history should not be necessarily controversial and your particular views about what jewish history has been should not be colored by your personal preferences. Before the, I guess you, you would call it the Renaissance or modernity, basically all Jews lived in a community which was under an established church wherever they lived in in muslim lands obviously it was under uh, islam and the government there and in christian countries it was under uh well i guess mostly the roman catholic church and the people who were respected as religious leaders fell into two categories the first category being officials and to this day um in religious circles the word official actually means something that is kind of fake right it, if if somebody's the official rabbi, that means they hold that position, but they're not respected as having that position. Because what certainly took, what was certainly true in Europe, which is where much of uh, Jews lived is that the position of rabbi was something that was purchased and 
the person who became the rabbi was not always, but often considered a stooge for the government. There was there was still respect for people who were scribes, who were shochtim, uh, which are lit, uh, ritual slaughters. There, but they weren't necessarily the official rabbi, and so coming into modernity there was limited amount limited access to uh jewish books because there was limited access to all books we were talking about manuscripts right this was before the printing press and manuscripts are expensive not everybody had access to them things changed rather dramatically with the printing press um and there was changes in the non-jewish world which also became reflected in the jewish world so the gutenberg bible was printed in 1454 the Shulchan Aruch, right, which is usually translated as Code of Jewish Law, the words themselves actually mean set table because it was a codification of Jewish law by Rabbi Yosef Karo. And he lived in Tzfat, which is in Israel. And he wrote the Shulchan Aruch in 1563. Rabbi Moshe Iserlis wrote, uh, he actually called it the tablecloth, the mampa, um, which was notes on the Shulchan Aruch, which ever since 1574, all versions of the Shulchan Aruch pretty much have, have print, been printed with um uh, the notes glosses by rabbi israelis rabbi cairo was sephardic rabbi israelis was uh ashkenazi and this is where that divide between sephardi and ashkenazi really became codified honestly and all modern Jews descend from communities that accepted the Shulchan Aruch as the definitive code of Jewish law. Um, there are certainly lots of communities no longer, especially um, non-Orthodox, uh, they reject the Shulchan Aruch. But Karaites, eh, there are some uh, 50,000 Karaites in the world today. There are some 15 million Jews, and pretty much all of them descend from communities that accepted the Shulchan Aruch. And the point of departure between the various communities came in response to the Shulchan Aruch. I would say these five movements um, can be said to have really defined and defined how Judaism responded to modernity. Um, Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov founded Hasidism. Hasidism was uh, a popular movement. It's still a pretty popular movement. Even people who aren't Hasidic 
often uh, oftentimes can be described as neo Hasidic because the influence of Hasidism has been incredible. I mean, Judaism today has has been largely defined by Hasidism, I would say. Um, and that includes it among Sephardim, and it also includes whether or not they want to uh, admit it, the what are now called Lithuanians, but who called themselves the Mitnagdim, the uh, opponents of Hasidism, um, and even modern orthodoxy to, to, to some extent. So the Hasidic movement was revivalist and it was anti-corruption, it was popular, uh, and it, it created a sort of revival within Judaism. The Haskalah, which literally means enlightenment, the Jewish enlightenment, in, to some extent was a competing movement. It was uh, made up by people who wanted to see Judaism going away from what they considered to be superstition. Uh, they were really into studying Judaism as history, uh, studying the, the Hebrew language as in a grammatical fashion. The, there, there became a contradiction between the Haskalah, the Maskilim, and the Hasidim, which were both attempts to change the the status quo. Uh, the most well-known person affiliated with Haskalah would be Moses Mendelssohn. Uh, his name is well known. I'm, I'm not sure if it's correct to say that he was really the founder of that. And then there was Reform Judaism. Abraham Geiger is apparently, uh, he's actually not a well-known name, um, but he's the founder of Reform Judaism. And Reform Judaism started in Germany as an attempt to duplicate the Protestant Reformation within Judaism. These were people who saw many Jewish practices as backwards. Um, re to the point where at least some of these people <laughs> were plenty happy to say things like Berlin is our Jerusalem. We are uh, not looking forward to going back to Israel. The, obviously after World War II this became a source of great embarrassment. Um, but Orthodox Judaism actually became a denomination um, and the person who's considered kind of the founder of the movement to repel Reform Judaism is um, Samson Rafael Hirsch. His writings are still very influential. And so Orthodox Judaism in Germany started to be seen in contradic contradistinction to Reform Judaism. Whereas in other places, Orthodox Judaism continued pretty much how it had been, um, or it was Hasidism, which was 
in um which was also not happy with reform ideas and this idea of changing Judaism to become more modern, uh, to start seeing Jewish religion in terms of how Christians define faith. Another movement which became very influential was Zionism. And basically everybody else was the leaders of all the other movements uh, and communities were all very much opposed to Zionism, whereas it, it had a lot of pub popular support. And um, I'm, I'm not going to get into the whole history of Zionism, but it should be noted that basically everybody, Hasidim, Reform, Orthodox, certainly everybody who considered themselves religious were opposed to this secular idea of, of a Jewish state as it first started and while religious Zionism did develop that was something that historically started to happen outside of these movements okay I think I think I've set up a pretty clear um, basic outline of the ID I, I hate to say ideologies, but trends of thought within Judaism at the time. Jews in America um, ended up being defined in four streams, really three streams, but what's happened recently has made the difference between Agudat Israel and the Orthodox Union more strong. The 1885 Pittsburgh platform was the original platform of Reform Judaism in America. I highly recommend reading it. Uh, it has certainly become a source of embarrassment for Reform Judaism. <laughs> um, their new platforms are basically repudiations of the Pittsburgh platform. Um, I don't know how much more I can say about that, but history, history showed that the course of Judaism did not follow the ideas the people who wrote the Pittsburgh platform had. Um, the Traif Banquet, while it was slightly before the Pittsburgh platform, is oftentimes cited as where conservative Judaism splintered off from reform. The, there was a graduation uh, dinner for the first class of reform rabbis to be um, to graduate, I believe th this was Hebrew Union College at the time. Um, might have been called something else at the time, but uh, there were a group of rabbis who felt that reform was going way too far. Um, they were too willing to reject Jewish tradition and the Traif Banquet kind of became a rallying cry for conservative. Both Orthodox Judaism as a movement, as a denomination, and conservative Judaism define themselves in contradistinct 
distinction to reform Judaism. Unfortunately, <laughs> I think it's pretty evident that reform has found itself to be an exit ramp um, as far as the Jewish community is, is concerned. There are very, very few people who are second or third, certainly fourth or fifth generation reform. Um, most people who end up in, at a reform synagogue end up having either, it's funny, the, um, I think his name is Eric Yaffe. He's, he was the leader of reform Judaism. He, he has this article talking about his two children. His son is secular and an activist like so many secular Jews are. And his daughter, for at least a while, attended Chabad. Um, he claims that she still identifies as reform, despite the fact she she lives a very traditional Jewish lifestyle in ways that are <laughs> that most of reform finds incomprehensible. Um, and that is the experience of even the most religious people who go to reform synagogues. The Orthodox Union, um, to some extent, I mean, it, it certainly is the largest uh, group of rabbis. It is, to some extent, affiliated, associated with modern orthodoxy. The Aguda is where the people who really consider themselves Haredi um, hang their hat. And the Haredi, which are called um, ultra-Orthodox pejoratively, have been growing in a lot, have been growing in influence partially because of the fact that they have all the children within the Jewish community. It's the Haredi population, which tends to have, I believe the average is somewhere around six or seven children. Very, very few other Jewish communities um, can have even a replacement rate. Two kids, maybe and and so demogra the demographic change is very very clear and that's part of what makes reform conservative and even to some extent modern orthodox fall off the table um yeah I mean, you, you, can, you can look into the demographics more, but I think it's, it's pretty clear, and I think any honest evaluation sees that the future of the Jewish community is ultra-Orthodox. It's not even Orthodox. And a large part of that is what's going on in Israel. Now, there was an, what's called old yeshuv, which are the Jews who were living in Israel before secular Zionism. Many of these people were very strongly anti-Zionist. They felt that the Zionists 
were not were causing all sorts of problems and they formed the Eda Haredit which is actually quite inf influential today although it certainly isn't it might you might be able to call it non-Zionist most people who are associated with it can't really be con called anti-Zionist anymore. Ruff Cook, interesting figure, you might want to look him up, was the first chief rabbi of Israel, I believe. Well, I mean, he wasn't, the, he, he died before the establishment of the state of Israel. He was um, a religious Zionist. And he basically founded what was, it's still pretty small in comparison, and we'll, uh, we'll look at the numbers, but he founded the religious Zionist movement, which was affiliated with the state of Israel and the chief rabbinate. And has grown um, in 1948 Agudat Israel was formed it it somewhat still continues to be a coalition of both what's called Lithuanian which were the anti-Hasidic and the Hasidic um, wings These are people who would describe themselves as non-Zionists, whereas the anti-Zionists would describe them as Zionists. Uh, they won't call themselves religious Zionists, but there, there definitely is a strong identification with the state of Israel. Um, now, these are the religious groups. I have to be clear about that. Most Jews in Israel are Orthodox Jews because the chief rabbinate is Orthodox. They consider the, themselves what's called Masorti, which means traditional, which means I'm not really religious, but the synagogue I would go to when I want to go to a synagogue is an Orthodox synagogue. Reform and conservative from the United States have tried very hard to redefine Masorti to mean reform and conservative, especially conservative in the United States likes to translate their name to Masorti and kind of co-opt the people who call themselves Masorti in, in Israel. There is a sharp divide between the people who are religious in Israel and the people who do not consider themselves religious. That divide tends to go along the lines of whether or not you keep the sabbath so somebody who keeps the sabbath doesn't drive on the sabbath and that's a huge dividing line um it, it also tends to go along with whether or not you keep kosher um by the way there are some viewers if you guys have any questions feel free to interrupt me and ask um, in 1984, a particularly divisive person uh, decided to break off from Agudat Israel and create a, a political party called Degel HaTorah, which means flag of the Torah. For the Lithuanian Jews, um, 
And later, he was also involved in creating what became Shas, which was which is the um, which is became the party of religious Sephardic Jews. United Torah Judaism is a combination of Aguda and Degel Hatora, and they it's funny they care about the distinctions between themselves more than anybody else does or more and certainly more than most people can can see um the chief rabbinate of israel has changed dramatically as the nature of the state of Israel has changed dramatically over um, the past 80 years. Part of that is that after the 60s and 70s, there started being what's called the Baal Teshuvah movement, which is groups of people who were not raised part of the Haredi environment, but started ad adopting it. Um, Chabad was very instrumental in this. Part of that be was because of what almost everyone in the 60s and 70s saw was the miraculous hand of God in the history of the state of Israel. That changed the view, certainly of reform and conservative, but also among Orthodox Jews, about how they felt about the state of Israel. Certainly, a lot more religious Zionism became involved. People started caring a lot more about what the chief rabbinate had to say. Um, the chief rabbinate of Israel, certainly in the beginning, was not widely respected among people who were religious. It was not very influential outside of Israel, certainly not in the United States. Part of what changed that was the character of Rabbi Ovadia Yosef. Um, Rav Ovadia was Sephardic. Um, I believe he was born in Iraq, but came to Israel at a young age. And he being Sephardic, he was not considered ingrained in anti-Zionism. He took the position of Rishon Letzion in 1973, which is the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel. Um, this his adoption of that position was actually um sorry i'm just looking at the thing and uh, uh his adoption of that position actually meant that the chief rabbinate gained in prestige because somebody of his caliber was willing to take the position. Um, Rav Avadia had an incredible memory. He apparently it was a photographic memory and he knew thousands of books by heart. Today, being able to act as a sort of 
index of all the religious books, all the responsa, is not as impressive as it was before computers and computer searches. Ravavadya wrote responsa, which were encyclopedic. He would bring basically every citation from every rabbi on a topic into his responsa. And this made his writing in a sense required reading for all the orthodox rabbis because if you wanted to know who where all the citations are right you would you would go to the, a responsa in yabia omer was the name of um his his biggest um, the other was Yechavedat, which was n meant to be more less for rabbis. Yabia Omer was for um, was meant for rabbis, and and so his he was intensely respected among Ashkenazim which in turn made him a source of pride among Sephardic Jews who were often considered less than, not as smart, not as capable as the Ashkenazim. In many sense, people would say backwards. And Ravavadya reversed that and in taking the position of Rishon Letzion, chief Sephardic rabbi of Israel, he actually gave that position more respect than it had before from religious Jews. In 1984, he founded Shas, which became the religious party for Sephardic Jews. Um, let me, I believe I have the numbers. Yeah. So the, this is the most recent election results in Israel. United Torah Judaism, which is a combination of Degel HaTorah and Agudat Israel, has seven seats out of 120. Shas has nine seats. And a coalition of the Dati Laumi, of the religious Zionists, have six seats. That's not... I don't think a reflection of their actual numbers. I think the religious Zionists are actually smaller in number, um, and at least some of those seats represent people either from UTJ or Shas who wanted to register a protest vote. But that gives the religious parties, 22 seats out of 120, that's 18%. This is a growing number. Partially it's growing because life in Israel is hard, and if you're not religious, there are a lot of easier places to make it in life. And so a lot, the the non-nationalist Israelis, the Israeli left, a lot of them are leaving the country. Many of them are not having children. Um, and increasingly, it's the religious which are keeping 
Israel a Jewish state? Yeah. So the groups among religious Jews today, there, this is somewhat in Israel, but honestly, it's starting to reflect religion in the United States as well. In Israel itself, people who identify as a Masorti tend to be people who are less religious or not religious, but consider religion, they're not anti-religious. Um, they tend to have a lot of criticisms of the chief rabbinate or the Haredim, but in Israel itself, the official rabbinate, there are very, very few reform and conservative Jews like we have in the United States. In the United States, reform and conservative synagogues, again, have become more and more secular places, really. Um, or they've started they've started practicing Judaism in ways that reform and conservative used to think was unnecessary. Reform synagogues have Hebrew today. They were very against the use or learning of Hebrew. They are increasingly keeping some forms of kosher. Again, <laughs> trafe banquet. They were very against that for a long time. Um, increasingly, people can be considered religious Zionists, even among the Haredi. Oftentimes, a lot of people think Chabad, for example, is Zionist and religious Zionist. And if you look into it, um, Chabad was actually very strongly anti-Zionist, and their views don't really fall into those camps very well. A lot of Haredim are increasingly Zionist. Um, and the word Zionist has changed its meaning because secular Zionism has, to some extent, died. Neo-Hasidism. So, part of what happened with the Baal Tshuva movement was that a lot of people who were not Hasidim started adopting Hasidism. A lot of people who continue to be very much outside of Hasidism um, are also have been deeply affected by Hasidic philosophy. Um, and these people are not accepted within older Hasidic um, communities nearly as much as they often would like to be. Um, certainly, there isn't a lot of marriage between most of people that would be considered neo-Hasidic and traditional Hasidim. Um, but neo-Hasidism has started certainly in Chabad and Breslev, but also in, in the larger Jewish environment. There are a lot of conservative and reform Jews. There's a lot of modern Orthodox Jews who can be considered neo-Hasidic. 
they are they have certainly been affected by Hasidism. Anti-Zionism is from everything I can see pretty much dying out. Part of that is the fact that increasingly anti-Zionism has become left-wing, increasingly anti-Zionism has become anti-Semitism. Um, the fact is that actual Jewish anti-Zionists have, to some extent, been thrown out of the anti-Zionist movement, to some extent been thrown out of the Jewish community. And one strange but interesting development has been the Noahide movement. The Noahide movement, I might just talk more about it in a separate thing for itself, came out of Christian efforts to convert Jews and to return to the Jewish roots of Christianity. I personally know several pastors who converted to Orthodox Judaism. Many synagogues, which started out as Messianic, which really meant these were churches disguised as synagogues in order to try to evangelize to Jews, ended up creating Christians who were more and more Jewish and less and less Christian. And while the number of Noahides is still very small, even in the, as far as the Jewish community goes, they certainly number in the tens of thousands. And I would say it's credible to say that there's probably somewhere around 100,000 Noahides, um, which means people whose religion is Orthodox Judaism, but they are not Jewish and they are not trying to convert to Judaism. I realize this is very surprising to some people, but Orthodox Judaism, and I believe this is easy to show uh, what has been true for thousands of years, has always believed that God has a relationship with non-Jews, something we refer to as the covenant of Noah, and Christians who became increasingly convinced of the truth of Judaism, but did not see any reason to convert to, to Judaism, have started in what is small numbers for Christians, but huge numbers for Jews, to believe that Orthodox Judaism is true, while at the same time deciding that there's no reason for them necessarily to convert to Judaism. And Judaism pretty much agrees with that. Most, we believe that God loves Gentiles too. And you don't have to convert to Judaism. And this has become a big influence in Orthodox Judaism, especially when you consider there are maybe a million, at most two million people who religiously believe in a theology of Judaism. I'm not talking about you know, there's some 15 million Jews, but the vast majority of those Jews consider themselves Jews because they were born into Judaism. 
they don't necessarily agree with the ideas of Judaism. Um, and so the Noahide movement is, is actually growing and at amazing rates. So there's that. What about the other Jews? Well, in Orthodox Judaism, we say that Israel afal pi shechata Israel who that a Jew, regardless of whatever his sins may be, continues to be a Jew. So we don't deny that somebody who was born Jewish remains Jewish. But there are plenty of people who consider themselves Jewish only by race or by ethnicity. At the same time, there's plenty of people who believe that if you are a Jew who converted to Christianity, you should no longer call yourself a Jew. Well, Messianic Judaism is a term that Christians started using for Jews who converted to Christianity. Are they Jewish? It's a difficult question. There are plenty of people who are Jews by ethnicity. This is their ethnicity. This is their culture. They don't necessarily believe in any Jewish ideas, but it is their culture. Judaism as a race used to be a more prevalent idea than it is now, but there are people who do believe that Judaism is a sort of race. Most of those people tend to be anti-Semites who hate Jews at a, as a race, but that, for many Jews, creates a community for them, and they consider themselves Jewish because the anti-Semites do. And I would say for a lot of conservative and reform Jews, Judaism is an ethic and a form of humanism. Many, many, many reform and conservative rabbis do not believe in God in the traditional ways we define a belief in God, certainly in Christian circles. Um, and then there are the real Jews. And these are people who think that what everybody else considers Jews are not really Jews, but they're the real Jews. Um, included in this is are the uh, Black Hebrew Israelites, certain members of the Christian identity movement, especially people who believe that the Anglo-Saxons are the descendants of the real Jews and the rest of us are fake Jews. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's a brief overview of the people and the movements and the communities that make up Jews in the United States and Israel. I would say that most of the people who are Jews outside of the Anglosphere tend to reflect Jews in Israel. So in France, probably, um, I would say most that, or South America, that reflects Jew Judaism 
mostly as it exists in Israel. In the Anglosphere, probably Australia and the United Kingdom reflects more U.S. Judaism than Israeli Judaism, although there's a lot less of reform in the rest of the world outside the United States. Currently, Reform Judaism is a very American expression of Judaism. Um, for more resources, Rabbi Beryl Wine was, before YouTube existed, he was a very popular lecturer in Judaism. And his tapes are fascinating, but they're actual tapes. I think they're available on CDs. Um, they have not been uploaded to YouTube, as best I can tell. If, he ha if his lectures were uploaded on YouTube, they would likely become the most um, widely uh, listened to or watched history channel on YouTube, but as far as I know, they're not available there. He wrote uh, three books and he consulted on other projects about um, Jewish history. He was formerly the head of the Kashrut division, I believe, of the Orthodox Union. Um, his books were great reads. I highly recommend them. His lectures, I highly recommend them. Um, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin has written several books on Jewish history. If you're looking for books about Jewish history, probably Telushkin's books are the best place to start. Um, he's, he's had a lot of... Um, cooperation with Dennis Prager, who is orthodox-ish <laughs> in, in his views, um, even though he is not an orthodox Jew. Um, Dr. Henry Abramson has a very popular and very good YouTube channel on history, Jewish history. Um, you may want to actually watch his biographies on some of the people that I mentioned, especially probably Sam Samsel Samson Rafal Hirsch and the Baal Shem Tov, but also probably, um, well, Rav Cook, but, um, well, uh, Yosef Cairo, um, I'm not sure if he has one on Rabbi Isserlis, but um, I'm pretty sure he has one on Moses Men Mendelssohn and Theodore Hartzell, not sure about Abraham Geiger. Um, really interesting stuff um, on Dr. Abramson's channel. And obviously, if you have questions or requests, I am here. Um, and while I am not the best person to explain all this stuff, um, I do have some um, capacity. Yes, this was kind of a surprise for me too, but people asked and I, uh, I thought I would oblige. Um, If there are no questions, I am uh, going to um, end this stream. I will wait a few minutes to see if any of the people watching have questions or not.
Oh, do like and subscribe, please. <laughs>